<clears throat> okay, uh, hello. Um, uh, uh, today we'll talk about uh, Raymond Abraham, uh, a very important Austrian-American um, uh, architect. Uh, let's read a little bit um, uh, about him. Raymond Johann Abraham was born in 1933 in East Tyrol, Austria. And I think he was born on this day, the, uh, I even forgot, the 3rd of, uh, of March in, uh, in 1933. Throughout a 40 year uh, career, career, Abraham created visionary projects and built works of architecture in Europe and in the United States. From 1955 to 1958, Abraham studied at the Grass University of Technology. In 1959, he established a studio in Vienna where he explored the depths and boundaries of architecture through building, drawing, and montage. Uh, Abraham's first book, the 1965 publication, Elementare Architecture, was made at a time of transition between architecture studies and practice. In this early volume on elemental structures, Abraham explores the built environment, absent aesthetic speculation, and determinations about design. Instead of coming from the relative le level of knowledge and also the desires of the builder, in 1964, Abraham emigrated to the United States. Abraham was an influential architect in his native Austria and the New York avant-garde. Abraham's poetic architectural vision was influenced by the Viennese tradition to align architecture with sculpture and also by the Austrian physicist and philosopher Ernst Mach. Abraham theorized architecture on a collision course with the needs of humans yet striving for coexistence in a constant state of creative tension. Beginning in the late 1950s, his enigmatic architecture placed Abraham among the avant-garde, such as Hans Hollein, Walter Pichler, and Günther Domenic. In 1958, Abraham collaborated with Friedrich St. Florian, placing third in an international competition to design the Pan-Arabian University of Saudi Arabia, and in 1959, placing second for the design of the Democratic Republic of the Congo Cultural Center in Leopoldville. Abraham criticized mainstream architecture's preoccupation with style, its indifference to history, and the rigid definition of modernism at the time. Abraham went on to influence generations of professional architects through architectural drawings, projects, and teaching. Abraham explained his role as an educator as follows. Teaching forces me to engage in a critical dialogue with somebody else and find a level of, of objectivity that allows me to have a fair critical argument. My role as a teacher is simply to clarify, although that's a bit simplistic. When I give a problem to the students, it's not, it's my problem. I am trying to anticipate how, how I could solve that problem. And my joy is when the students come up with a solution I haven't thought of. This was the man. Uh, always with a hat on his head and uh, sometimes with a cigar. Architects love uh, cigars. Uh, here he is again. Uh, uh, Raymond Abraham uh, uh, was uh, a well-known and respected architect in New York City. Uh, in the absence of Raymond Abraham is a book which I actually have. And it was published by um, uh, Vienna, uh, in Vienna. Uh, in 2010, uh, some drawings. His drawings are uh, uh, remarkable uh, artistically and architecturally because they depict visions and uh, uh, as such they are free from, uh, you know, the often the banalities of what, uh, you know, commercial uh, architecture, if it is architecture at all, um, often cannot avoid. But his architecture is his uh, architectural visions are uh, are pure 
are abstract, are lyrical, uh, and uh, they seem to, to me, they seem to um, uh, have a preoccupation with the afterlife, with death. Um, the explorations of, of, of architecture that are um, uh, passionately personal. Pencil drawings. Raymond Abraham. In New York City, he was a professor at uh, Cooper Union, an excellent architecture school. At the time, uh, the dean was um, John Haydock. And uh, that's where he also developed a friendship with Lebia Suds, who was also teaching there. A very interesting school, Cooper Union. Interesting also because, uh, to, as far as I know, it's the only school in the United States which is free. I hope it's still free. In other word, words, it doesn't cost anything. But it's difficult to get in because uh, uh, only brilliant students get in, so to speak. So there is an exam that uh, tries to see if the student is brilliant or not. It's a very interesting school because it has three departments, architecture, painting, and engineering, <clears throat> if you can imagine. The three of them, um, you know, uh, um, contributing to what the Cooper Union School of Ar uh, uh, School is. And very famous uh, professors, Daniel Lipskind also studied there. He was the darling of John Haydock. Peter Eisenman was a professor there. Elizabeth Diller was a student, and then she became a, a professor there. Ricardo Scofidio, a professor there. A very special school. Some even thought that uh, Cooper Union at the time when John Haydock was a dean there was the best architecture school in the world that offered a bachelor degree in architecture. As far as I know, at that time didn't offer a, a master degree, but a, a bachelor degree. But it prepared poets, poets of architecture. Now you can imagine if your professor does this kind of uh, Visionary, visionary drawings, then the students would do something similar. He drew incessantly, Raymond Abraham. What surprised me was that uh, someone like Kenneth Frampton, I have uh, an issue of um, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui where Frampton writes a very poetical and metaphysical text about the, the works of Raymond Abraham. And, uh, Ray, and Kenneth Frampton is a, is a critic, uh, an architect, a theoretician who understands very well even the, the praxis of architecture, but very seduced by the cosmologies of um, Raymond Abraham and the poesis of his architecture, mainly manifested through drawing. But today I learned from a student here that uh, apparently Fra Frampton considers that, uh, uh, you know, the, the Austrian Cultural Center in, uh, in, uh, in New York is uh, among the three best um, you know, uh, architectures or tall buildings. Well, not only tall buildings, architectures in, uh, in, in New York, which is not a little thing. Well, we are going to see that tower here in many images. I love this dedication to architecture where the, 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 the architect, without being asked, produces visions, produces drawings in a quest for the essence of architecture. And maybe that, that book that they published together with the Levia Suits, uh, uh, Anti, 
um, with its uh, subtitle, you know, Journey to Architecture, is what all his life was about, a, a, journey, a journey towards architecture. Born from passion, mainly. A search, a quest, an adventure, a discovery. He loved to draw, of course. Actually, I thought about this project of Raymond Abraham. It could have been, uh, you know, uh, appropriate for that uh, linear city in Saudi Arabia, for a linear city of 170 kilometers. My God, my God. All, some, some aspects of his architecture, like this drawing, uh, show the influence of uh, postmodernism. It was the the time, you know, we, we, we cannot be totally different of what's going on around us. And so is his uh, architecture. But we, you see, besides buildings which uh, float, there are also excavations of the terrain, of the earth. So there is also a preoccupation with the underground. Now, the Austrian Cultural Center in New York, uh, the building that I mentioned, these are renderings, handmade drawings uh, of, uh, of this tower, which was built. And uh, bravo to him that he received the commission from Austria. They had other you know, good architects to do it, but he did it. He built it. And you see it here. This is the building. Very narrow and very tall, but it does stand out on this uh, front of uh, buildings in Manhattan. has around 20 floors is not so tall but considering how narrow the space is is remarkable that he achieved a, a building that seems to be taller than it actually is because of its narrowness and the type of architecture he uh, he chose He loved to draw. I mean, these are not construction drawings. They are, they are renderings, you know, but sections, studies, stu studies with a section through the building uh, that, that he did perhaps for his own pleasure. And here are the plans. Uh, sorry about the picture. It's not, um, the resolution is not really great. Anyway, it's a tall building, uh, narrow, uh, that uh, has uh, a number of floors, around 20. Here we see another quest for the essence of the building through uh, a drawing which is both lyrical, poetical, and technical. I like this drawing very much, this, um, you know, uh, constructed perspective of drawing. It's really about the pleasure of doing architecture, because again, this is not a working drawing. It's a study, but it's a study which has value, artistic value in itself.
So we see the two mirror images of the section. On the left, a rendering, and on the right, <clears throat> you know, a typical, uh, almost technical, you know, drawing of, of, of the same thing, of that section. This is seen from the back. the architect and his uh, ubiquitous uh, hat. But you see the building, although it has only 20 floors, it seems monumental. It seems it, it has a dignity and it, it, it has a, um, you know, a monumentality you wouldn't expect in Manhattan because you see there are buildings much taller than that building. But this building has personality. It's uh, infused with unicity. Now, a building, a housing, com well, a housing complex, a block of flats actually in Berlin. Berlin had a great initiative to build to three times during the, uh, the 20th century. <clears throat> they built in Berlin. They invited uh, important architects of the time to build um, a housing complex or a house in the 30s, in the 50s, and in the 80s. He built this building um, on Friedrichstrasse uh, in, in the 80s. And is this building. Berlin, Friedrichstrasse. There are some elements here that some I think, uh, you know, could, uh, could refer to a certain formalism, like for example, these diagonals, up here stairs or not? I, I don't think there are, but anyway, he, he liked symmetry and he liked uh, sometimes, yes, uh, diagonals uh, with real stairs or mimicking stairs. Raymond Abraham, Berlin. I forgot exactly, 1985, 1987, something like this. But you wouldn't expect actually the courtyard, the round circular uh, uh, courtyard in the back, as you can see in the plan. So this is the book uh, that that we read about uh, the beginning elementary architecture. And this is an image of the courtyard uh, that we saw in the plan of the same building in Berlin. Raymond Abraham. Now, what is this uh, house uh, also in Austria, uh, you know, a large house, again, symmetry, symmetry with some banished from uh, modern architecture, but he was not uh, shy to, to use symmetry because he was in search for a, a certain monumentality that symmetry uh, made uh, possible, perhaps uh, with some more ease. Austria. It's not necessarily perhaps, uh, you know, uh, the strikingly original architecture, 
Although maybe this symmetry is a sign of some originality. The building is, is strictly symmetrical with the exception of the swimming pool. He designed everything, the tables, and the, I guess he loved the labyrinth as well. This was an educated architect with a, an ample culture and with the, you know, references to, to history. Uh, The House of Music, um, an interesting uh, uh, project by him that was built also in Austria. Uh, concrete, of course, a lot of concrete. At that time, concrete was not considered uh, a pollutant, but it is. Anyway, the House of Music, I'm sure he loved music. And here we have the meeting uh, between music and, uh, and the geometry. There are also residences here, if I understood correctly. Uh, it's, an, it's a monument to, to music. Raymond Abraham. You see, a good architect is capable of, uh, of creating surprising, uh, you know, uh, architectural uh, crystallizations or configurations, you know, like you wouldn't expect, you know, in, in this part of the building to see this triangular uh, large opening. It's a surprise, an architectural surprise. And we see the, the plan, you know, yes, it operates with a, a, a basic geometry, a primal geometry, an elemental geometry. There is a level of mystery, uh, of uh, even of uh, mysticism here. You know, like what we look at here now is don't know exactly what it is, but it's clearly the theatralization of um, of ritual. He believed in a, 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 in a pure idealized architecture. I particularly, particularly like the fact that just like Louis Kahn did several times here, he combines concrete with wood. So you have the warmth and the intimacy of wood with, uh, with uh, the other attributes of concrete. So the core of the building is less cold. You move towards worms, and is the worms also of the material, wood.
the reality of the unveiled. I don't know if these are his words or the words of someone about his work, but it's something to contemplate, the reality of the unveiled. Or as his friend Levius Woods would have said, the reality of the ideal. Because he, even the unveiled could be real. And sometimes the, a certain unveiled is more real than many so-called real buildings that are built. The simple fact that a building is built doesn't make it by necessity real. Yes, it's built. So many buildings are built, but are they truly real? Just because they are built is not enough. Sometimes a drawing, a good drawing, is more real than a built building that is, uh, you know, unimportant, that doesn't say anything. To me, that's not a real building, although it is built, while a drawing, let's say, by Santelia is real, although it's just a drawing. I guess it was an exhibition at, in this house of music with this title, The Reality of the Unbuilt. We are approaching the end of this short presentation on uh, Raymond Abraham. This is a project he did for New York City, but it didn't get built. Uh, an unrealized project by Abraham for a structure on Delancey Street on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, this is a quotation from Maurice Blanchot, the song of the sirens. In what direction is architecture moving? Architecture moves towards itself to dissolve in itself, to become speechless for the sake of silence, yet filled with a desire to signify its solitude, silent, unknown, sign. In the written image, immutable. In the drawn image, unspeakable. In the built image, uninhabitable. The mystery of these images becomes the myth of the journey of architecture and the odyssey of the imaginary inhabitants who attempt to decipher them. A nice text. So this is uh, the, the, the project which was not built. And if it would have been built, it would have been very nice, no? But it was not built. Compare what he proposed with the surroundings. Two other unrealized projects, Beijing Center for Wellbeing, He died, as I said, or I didn't, and I should have, perhaps he died at 78 in a car accident in Los Angeles. And the World Trade Center, New York, Ground Zero, Bird's Eye View. I couldn't find great, uh, great pictures of, of, of this. So that was his proposal for a new World Trade Center. It's not very clear to understand what, what he proposed here. And here we see a little better. So I don't think Raymond Abraham was the most modest architect in the world, but architects are usually not very modest, almost as a definition. And he wasn't either. As you can see, he proposed uh, several towers, several prisms. Now a chair, a furniture, a piece of furniture. Uh, <laughs> you know, no, not the most comfortable chair in the world and made it's more like a chair for thinking than a chair for sitting. It's, it's perhaps a chair for a schismatic being, for a person with a bipolar personality, or for Faust himself, the character of Goethe's writing 
um, that says, uh, alas, two souls are dwelling in my heart. Well, this chair is indeed, uh, you know, a schismatic chair, a chair with a rift, a chair with a schism. Well, death is implied here. And as I mentioned earlier, his architecture is also um, continuously, I would say, aware of the finality of life. And this is about the finality of a chair. It's a chair which uh, uh, in a preemptive way uh, declares that it's aware of its own dissolution or destruction at one point. So it's a, it's a dis, you know divided chair that, that makes us aware that you know the, the the stability of an object, architectural or otherwise, is only temporary. Of course, the functionalist could not accept such a such a statement as this chair is. Again, it's more a chair for thinking than a chair for sitting. And this is the last uh, project I show by him, his uh, New York Times Tower project, a competition I participated myself in, and I showed the project um, the other day, or uh, you know, two or three days ago. Uh, what he proposed, in my opinion, is not uh, the greatest, um, uh, you know, inspirational architecture. And the reason I say this is because, it's, for my from my point of view, is uh, is rather uh, repetitive and, um, in a, you know, mechanicist, mechanical uh, uh, project, uh, an additive um, architecture, because what he did, indeed, 42nd Street is famous for its, um, you know, theaters. So he placed, uh, uh, you know, little, little theaters, one on top of the other. He stacked them one above the other, and it became you know, what was supposed to be a new Times Tower. This was the competition uh, for, a, for a, a new Times Tower. He received actually the, I think the first prize or one of the first prizes he received, he was awarded for this work, but in my opinion, it's not his greatest work. And I don't think I say this because I also participated in that competition, but uh, I, I, I didn't win. Uh, anything, but I don't regret I, um, I I participated. So this is the project of Raymond Abraham for uh, Times Tower in New York, and uh, I allow myself to also show my own little well, I shouldn't say little, my own project uh, submitted to this competition, and this is what I mean by another proposal for New York Times Tower. Is this one? This was the project I did. And I took the liberty to, to propose two towers. If you look at the site plan, you have um, Broadway and 7th Avenue intersect at 45th Street. So the clepsydra or the hourglass configuration of the urban context inspired me. And because I like hourglasses, I proposed two towers, the Times Tower, and I replaced the existing Coca-Cola building at 48th Street. So I proposed two towers, a red tower uh, symbolizing the sun, fire, and the king, and the white tower symbolizing uh, the queen, uh, water, and the moon. And uh, it also happens that uh, here is south and here is north. So of course, south connects with sun, with, with sunlight, and the sun is also uh, the sun. The sun is is fire, so that's why I made the the tower red. So it's a, it's an a, an homage, a celebration of fire, the mythical king or the masculine principle, and uh, and um, on the other side uh, a white uh, tower that symbolizing the mythical queen, the feminine principle the moon and water. So you have um, facing each other fire and water, the sun and the moon, the king and the queen. 
And then in front of both towers, I, I proposed giant urban chairs, kind of thrones, where, where on the white chair sits the red king and on the red chair sits the white queen. But you have to understand that the scale of Manhattan, these were huge. You could have um, passed easily underneath the seat on which the Red King or the White Queen sat. So this was my proposal for um, for um, for uh, for that competition, where Raymond Abraham, uh, Abraham uh, uh, proposed this uh, proposed this tower. So that was it. Thank you very much.